Perfect. So um, I love this. I have no idea where this came from, and I would love to find the original. So if anyone ever finds the original, let me know. I got vaccinated as a kid. As a result, I'm now starting to gray and bald. My balding got so bad I had to shave my head. Because of vaccines, I have started aging instead of dying as a baby. Um, and so when you first start reading this, you think this is another anti-vaccine moment, but it's not. Uh, it really celebrates the success of our vaccination program. As we save the lives of children, they grow up into adults, and now we have a mega number of adults. <laughs> Um, there has been a large demographic shift. There was a lot of mention of this yesterday. We anticipate that by 2050, 80% of older people will actually be in low and middle income countries. Previously, we thought this was an upper income um, country issue, but it is rapidly becoming an issue for all countries. In 2020, our number of adults over 60 outnumbered our children less than five. Huge numbers. Um, and between 2015 and 2050, we'll estimate that 22% of the population will be over 60 years of age. Okay. It is unclear how COVID is going to impact this. You know that those with the highest death rates were those over 60, 70, and 80 years of age. Russia and the U.S. had the biggest declines in expected life. Um, so we may see some of the early estimated numbers of older adults decline, but I will tell you it doesn't really matter. There's still a lot. Okay. Um, I'm going to show you a couple slides of disease burden in older adults. So these are deaths due to C. diff. We don't usually think of C. C. diff causing deaths, but in older adults is a major cause of death. This is data from Finland much earlier. And as you see, those over 64 are the majority of deaths. This is herpes and post herpetic neuralgia. So, the, I mean, zoster and post herpetic neuralgia. Um, so the dark is the incidence of herpes zoster, and then the, the lighter gray is the incidence of post herpetic neuralgia. These numbers grow. I want you to notice they start growing at 50. For some reason, the decline that we see starting as teenagers um, really becomes impactful at 58, 50 and above. Personally, 50 is really young. <laughs> Um, but when we look at programs, we have to realize that this decline has major impact on infectious diseases starting at age 50. This is COVID. We've all seen these graphs. Um, the oldest age groups have the highest death rates. I mean, it declines after that as we get younger, but still incredible rates of death um, purely based on age. All right, so why do we see this? There are lots of reasons. One is malnutrition. One is comorbidities. One is polypharmacy. One are anatomic changes. And the last is immune senescence, which we'll take a lot of time on. All right. So this is the prevalence of comorbid conditions as we age. So the percent of patients with the disorders, the darker blue you get, the more disorders you have. And the x-axis is age. So if you look at those 85 plus, all of them have comorbid conditions, except for some very rare people, but who are totally awesome. Um, but as we age, we pick up more and more comorbid conditions. This is incredibly important because as we start to do randomized control trials in older adults, do I have a little pointer? Um, we tend to enroll those in that light blue color. Those over 65 who come in to do our clinical trials are really healthy and are so anxious to, like, go in for multiple visits. That is not who we see in practice. In practice, we see older adults with lots of comorbid conditions. So remember that as you look at these clinical trials that are now coming out in older adults, we really need to start enrolling those with those comorbid conditions. All right. So let's talk about polypharmacy. We love antibiotics. 
And for some reason, anytime a woman over 65 looks cross-eyed, she gets diagnosed with a urinary tract infection and is given antibiotics. Literally. I, that's my job as an infectious disease doctor, to stop the antibiotics and figure out why she looks cross-eyed. Um, the number of antibiotics that we use over a lifetime greatly changes the microbiome. We have a symbiotic relationship with our microbiome, and it's incredibly important to maintain that. As we disrupt that, we allow certain infections to occur. We give out steroids like they're antibiotics, like they're water. Oh, your knee hurts. Let me give you a, a pulse of steroids. Um, oh, you have chronic lung disease. Let me put you on some steroids. This acts as an immune suppressive in a situation where we already know we have immune senescence. And lastly, opioids. We have found over time that opioids is a respiratory suppressant. We know this. This is one of the reasons people die from opioids. When we suppress your respiratory drive, we put you at risk for pneumonia. And there have been actual studies that show this. All right. This is a busy slide. I just want you to look at the lung. We're just going to stay on the pneumonia track like we just did with opioids. As we age, we have reduced cough strength. Our cilia are not as active, so they don't push things out of the airway like they should. We have decreased elasticity. We have an increase in alveolar size. And this equals higher risk of pneumonia. Thank you. Okay. All right, so we're going to talk about immune senescence. It has lots of, of names, um, weighing immunity, um, inflammation, immune senescence. Um, and what is immune senescence? It is actually the changes in the immune system associated with aging. Some of this is normal and adaptive, and we'll talk about that, but a lot of it is maladaptive. When does it start? Well, it depends on the person which makes it incredibly difficult to determine when and how to use vaccines in this population. Babies all come out with the same immune system or similar immune systems for the most part, and we, there's a pretty regular schedule. We know when they acquire new skills. As we lose skills as an adult, we have no idea when an individual age group loses an individual. This occurs in both the innate and the adaptive immunity. Okay. Very briefly, let's talk about innate. Neutrophils, monocytes, dendritic cells, and K cells, you've learned about these this week. Um, they just do not work like they used to. Neutrophils do not get to the site of infection like they used to. Um, you'll notice that some of them put out more cytokines and some put out less. So I want you to realize this is not everything stops working. This is everything becomes somewhat dysregulated. So some of our cytokines are up and some of them are down. Some of our cell numbers are um, down. Some of them are up. This is especially important in our adaptive immunity. So there are differences between the young and the older. As we age, we have decreased antibody production. We have increased memory cells. There's a lot of theories that chronic CMV infection uses up our T-cells because CMV is this chronic infection, and your T-cells are always combating it. And so this nice pool of naive T-cells starts getting used up. And this is probably true not just for CMV, but EBV and other herpes viruses. Also, you start to lose your thymus, which is where those naive T-cells come from. Helps when you hit the right button. Okay. We know when you have an infection, there's a rapid rise in inflammation. And your body is then programmed to have a rapid decline in that response. Those are those nice two graphs that go up and go down. This is the normal immune response. This is how you kill a pathogen without killing yourself. As we age, we begin to accumulate a regular baseline of inflammation. I like to call it the screaming kid phenomenon. How many of you had kids and they've screamed all day long 
and nothing's really wrong. And then all of a sudden they have fallen down the steps and hurt themselves and they're still screaming and you're not paying attention because they've been screaming all day. So your immune system as you age may act like this. There's so much inflammation that if something happens, it's like, oh, there's something happening. Um, and that actually will be a slow response to that infection. And hence, you don't have that quick rise and cytokines and that normal response. Okay. So the consequences of immune senescence are you are more likely to get infected. You are less likely to rebound from that infection. You'll see this. Kids get sick and two days later, they're great. And you're still like, oh, I'm dying. Um, it's not fair how they do that. Kids spread all pathogens. They only share body fluids. Okay. Um, because of this, they are less likely to respond to immunization. Everyone's thought is, oh, they're old. They have immune senescence. I'll give them a vaccine. Without thinking, will they respond to the vaccine? Will the vaccine provide the same protection as it provides younger people? The flu is a perfect example of this. It was developed between World War I and World War II because the Army lost more men to flu than to war in World War I. They were determined to have a vaccine. So we tested that vaccine at Army recruits and young college students. And then in 1960, the U.S. was like, you know, I wonder if it'll work in older adults. We should recommend it for all adults over 65. I'm not kidding. That's what the paper says. No trials, no changes to the vaccine. And this has been the history of adult and older adult um, vaccinations. It's not till recently we thought, oh, we should try to design it for older adults. And maybe we should test it in older adults. All right. Some of these changes are probably adaptive. I've given this talk about dysregulation, and Paul Henri sits in the back and goes, Kip, some of this is normal. Um, and some of it probably is evolutionary Evolution, evolutionary, whatever, appropriate. Um, so your thymus involutes, it requires less energy. Theoretically, you should have seen all the pathogens that you're ever going to be exposed to, right? Until COVID comes along. But theoretically, you have seen everything. All right. So I have referenced multiple times, it's not just the age. As Indiana Jones says, it's not the years, honey, it's the mile, mileage. All right, um, you know 60-year-olds who are frail and have difficult with mobility, and these are the ones who will unlikely respond to vaccination. And then you have these 80-year-olds that are doing the Senior Olympics, and they're throwing parties, and they are doing fabulous. So age is not the perfect way to determine someone's immune status. All right, so how do we do this? Well, one of the theories currently is that we can measure frailty. You know this. This is the person. You can have a diabetic in each of your patient exam rooms. And, you know, one of them is not going to make it five years, and one of them is going to do fine. So how do you quantify that? How do you make it measurable? Um, there are multiple different methods. Walk speed, grip strength, number of comorbid conditions. But really... What impact does it have? So I love this study. This is pneumococcus. This is the only time I will talk about the pneumococcal vaccines. Um, if you look the, as we go across the x-axis for each of these, there's low frailty, medium frailty, and high frailty. Okay? So the more frail you are and you're given a vaccine, the less likely you are to respond. What about flu? If we look Pre- and post-vaccination to an influenza vaccine, the more frail you are, this is on the left side, the less likely you are to have an immune response. Doesn't matter which type of flu, A or B, which subtype, H1, H3. And then if you move to the right side of this graph, you'll see, well, who got infected? It's a big surprise, the ones who had the poor antibody response were the ones most likely to get infected. All right. So I have just gone through this whole thing about how the immune system really doesn't work great. The vaccines don't really work great in this thing. So why the heck do we use vaccines in older adults? It seems like a waste. Um, but we really don't use them to necessarily prevent infection. 
So we give kids a measles vaccine and they're protected for life. When we are vaccinating our older adults, it's the pathogens that they've already seen and have not figured out how to create a completely um, immune response to provide protection, nor have they made a lasting immune response. So we're already working with pathogens that our own immune system has difficulty with. So when we are preventing, um, when we're using vaccines, we're no longer trying to just prevent infection. We're trying to prevent the complications due to infection. Okay? So when we talk to our patients and when we do public health messaging, we give flu vaccine so you don't end up in the hospital. We give flu vaccine so you don't get a secondary bacterial pneumonia. This is really important. Really helps when you hit the right button. Okay, so this is a complicated slide. These are days post-event. All right, so three days versus 30 days. This is the risk of myocardial infarction. If I give you a flu vaccine, there's no change in your risk of myocardial infarction. If I give you a Tdap vaccine, there's no risk. If you get the flu, there is a massive risk of myocardial infarction within the first three days. So if I give you a flu vaccine, I may prevent you from having a heart attack. That's not how we think. We think if I give you a flu vaccine, you don't get flu. Well, you still might get flu. I'm hoping you don't have this heart attack. Very similar responses with stroke. This also makes it incredibly difficult to do our cost-effective analyses because no one includes heart attack and stroke in their cost-effective analysis. But that's really what we're trying to do. All right. So can we turn back the clock? There are lots of people who will sell lots of things to make you young again. But there's actually some science to it. They are still learning. These are some of the methods that we think have an impact. Um, and they're going to be very interesting over time. But for those of us who are already in immune senescence, we may be able to slow it somewhat, but there's still going to be more work to be done. So there are some actual immunization strategies in addition to vaccinating with the vaccines that we currently have, to improve the health of older adults. I don't want you to live forever. You might want to, but um, what we want is improve the quality of life for older adults. Everyone will begin to develop disability, and what we want to do is compress that time of disability and provide a good life in the meantime, okay? So I'm not talking about keeping people alive at 200 and keeping them bedridden. All right, so yesterday we talked a ton about pneumococcus. Um, that is the prime example. If you vaccinate children with the correct vaccine, you can lower disease in older adults. And I'm not kidding. Younger kids only share body fluids, not saliva and some others which or not play to talk about, they're the disease spreaders. And one of the reasons that works so well is we have a standing platform for vaccination for kids in most places. And people want to give money for kids. They don't want to give money for older adults. All right. One is to vaccinate healthcare workers. We'll talk about that. And then we're going to talk about actually designing vaccines for older adults and which ones have been. All right. Love this slide. It's one of my favorite. These are nursing homes. These are four different studies in nursing homes. And they went to these nursing homes and said, hey, we want you to vaccinate your healthcare workers. And then the, the control groups were, they just didn't talk to them. They ignored them and didn't talk about flu vaccine and didn't provide flu vaccine. We are talking about vaccinating the healthcare workers and not the patients. And these places did not reach 100%. This was not like the mandatory immunization that occurs in some countries in some nursing homes. And what they found is the nursing homes that vaccinated, the dark blue, the patient mortality rate was much lower than in the studies where the healthcare workers were not actively vaccinated. What does this tell you? We are getting our patients sick. We suck it up and go in with our runny nose and thinking we're the stuff. Um, and uh, we get them sick. 
They're not going to the grocery store. They're not going to church. We are introducing this vaccine. We are introducing this virus. We know flu vaccine does not prevent transmission completely. But we know if we reduce the transmission, we are less likely to spread it. And this shows us it's incredibly important for us not to bring it into work. All right, so let's talk about vaccines for the aging immune system. All right, this is shingles. We're going to start with shingles. Shingles is one of my favorite because this was the first vaccine that was really, truly designed for older adults, tested in older adults, and used in older adults. Um, For any of you who are not familiar with shingles, the big complication is post-herpetic neuralgia. It is a horrible pain syndrome that makes some patients bedridden. Um, Some of them commit suicide because the pain is so severe. Um, It is not a minor thing. The original shingles vaccine took the childhood vaccine and said, let's womp up the dose. Let's give a really high dose of Angen and let's see if this works in older adults. So this was a live attenuated vaccine. They enrolled a whole bunch of older adults. They followed them. They called them every month. I mean, these older adults were rock stars. They would answer these calls every month for years. And what they did is they looked for shingles. And they would swab the shingles to say, was this due to the vaccine or is this natural? Um, And what they found was a marked reduction in the incidence of herpes zoster. Overall, it prevented about half of the cases. If you looked at those that were younger, so 60 to 69 years of age, it had about a 64% efficacy. However, when you get to those over 70, we're down to about 38% efficacy. So notice, as we age, less effective. Um, But this is the cool slide. This is the home run. This is the complication of shingles that we were talking about. And this is what we talk about. We prevent the complications of these infections. With this vaccine, in all age groups, they were able to reduce the incidence of post-herpetic neuralgia by two-thirds. That's a home run. Because that vaccine was live attenuated, it couldn't be used in our immunocompromised patients and wasn't as effective in our much older adults. So this is a vaccine where they said, we're going to use an adjuvant. Have you all talked about adjuvants yet? Yeah. Um, what's the word? Alchemy? Is that the, the word that Dr. Freed uses? Um, so they use an adjuvant and use a glycoprotein that's seen in the herpes zoster virus. This is phenomenal. The whole idea is that we're going to stimulate the immune system and we're going to get the response we want. This is an itty-bitty slide, but y'all can download the slides and actually see the numbers. The VE in all age groups was over 90%. When I first read this article, I thought they had fudged the data. We don't have any vaccine that's this effective. 90 Over 90% for the prevention of shingles. And if we prevent shingles, we prevent post-herpetic neuralgia. All right. So flu is our vaccine that we decided to use in older adults without any data. I actually have a copy of that paper. Um, so we have been looking at ways of improving it. How much time do I have left? Um, zero, but keep going. You're almost okay. done. I'll right. your slide. All right. So um, one of the things was to increase the antigen. And so what they did is some early studies that said, if we increase the amount of hemagglutinin in these vaccines, what happens? And we actually do get improved antibody responses, um, but it kind of taps out around 60 micrograms. And so one of the studies or one of the new vaccines is the high-dose influenza vaccine. It's been around for years now. Um, And what they did is they put 60 micrograms of each of the antigens in to see what happens. Now, to do this study, which they did in a country that recommends flu vaccine, is you can randomize the placebo. So patients are randomized either high-dose or standard-dose. And what they found, about 24% better response. So that's a relative efficacy, and that's really important. Um, and maybe that's – do we do a topic on relative e- efficacy, Kamal? Yeah, a little bit. Okay. All right. All right. So another way, which has been done in Europe, which is done for many years, is to put an adjuvant, which is MF59. It's hopefully will give a broader immune response and more of a T-cell response. And that has been used for a very long time. All right. So our older adult population is growing. 
Um, we need better vaccines. We need to test them in older adults, and we need to test them in our older adults with lots of comorbid conditions. We need to buy some buses to go out to their houses to visit them. Um, we need to test them in nursing home patients because we always want to use these vaccines in nursing home patients. Um, and remember, it's not just age, which makes it very difficult when we make policies. Okay, I'll shut up now and take questions. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. Yes. Oh, oh, I got to show you this. This is totally depressing. So these are the world records for men in the marathon. Notice you peak at 30. <laughs> totally depressing. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. That was an interesting talk. So if you were to select like the blockbuster vaccines that we need to recommend to our grandparents, what would they be? The, all the, all of them or the zoster? Across all of them, what would you say? Oh, yeah. Uh, PCB20, not polysaccharide. The adjuvanted shingles vaccine. Any one of the enhanced flu vaccines. So the high dose, the adjuvanted, or there's flu block, which has three times the dose, which provides some extra protection. Hepatitis B, and there's an adjuvanted hepatitis B. And then we need to think of more. We need a group B strap one. So if anyone's working on group B strap, we see a ton of it in older adults. Thank you. You're welcome. What, why hepatitis B? How are they being exposed? Um, dialysis is the number one exposure. Two is we have a generation that didn't use condoms, and now they're back on the scene. Um, and we actually diagnose a fair amount of HIV in older adult men because their wife has died. They've started using prostitutes and don't know anything about condoms. Yeah, old people still have sex. Okay, yes. I am trying to read from Thailand. I just wonder about um, herpes zoster. Yes. What we observe in Asia, um, I feel like the incidence of herpes zoster might be lower than in Western countries. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Is it because of um, reasons or because of the the life expectancy is lower than in Western countries or because of the living conditions than living with the families rather than nursing home. Do you have an idea about the burden of herpes zoster in low and middle income countries? Yes. Thank you. So what we're finding in the U.S. is that we vaccinate our children for chickenpox. So we reduce the exposure of adults and older adults to the herpes zoster virus. So they don't get a regular boost of the immune system. If your child has chicken pox, you won't catch the chicken pox, but your body will be like, oh, yeah, I remember this virus and create an immune response. So the more times you're exposed, um, you, you self-vaccinate, basically. It's a good time for them to share their body fluids. Yeah. Thank you for this talk. Um, so we know that uh, flu effectiveness, uh, the effectiveness of the vaccine is not great um, for other uh, groups. Mm -hmm. uh, also, so should we be thinking of a strategy like adjuvanted vaccines or high dose vaccines for other target groups? Yes. Yeah, so uh, do we're well, actually we're kind of looking at that now. Do you use them in your immunocompromised? Do you use them with multiple comorbid conditions? We don't know. Those studies have not been done. Um, there is one investigator who's been looking at it in stem cell transplants, organ transplants, um, and that data is still pending. But, yeah, that may be. Yeah. I have a question about the CMV uh, inflammaging um, mm -hmm. hypothesis. Have there been uh, studies in CMV positive and negative older persons yeah. on immune responses? On yeah. Um, and they all have different results. So, <laughs> um, so I think larger studies that are more thorough in different regions need to be done. Um, most studies have very small older, numbers of older adults, um, and so we're still getting conflicting data. Yeah. I'm interested in what you think is the best strategy to improve responses. So we know in dialysis patients, for example, we increase dose for Hep B vaccine. In post transplant, we might give, or first flu vaccine, we give two doses a month apart rather than one, and sometimes we give additional doses. So, in the older adult, do you think there's an optimal strategy we should be looking at to improve response, or do you think we just have to go back to the drawing board and trial 
any number of those different strategies. Yeah, I think we have a lot to learn. Um, Because I mentioned earlier, our strategy was take a vaccine that works in young, healthy adults and then hope it worked in older adults or those that are immunocompromised. And so I think we have a lot of studies that need to be done to actually determine how to do this and how to do it correctly. Um, One of the strategies, though, is to vaccinate younger. While the immune system is less dysregulated to get that boost, and hopefully that will last a longer period of time. But that's all theoretical because we haven't done those studies. And also cost effectiveness often means that from a policy perspective, we don't approve vaccines younger because they're not cost effective. Yes. But in the long run, they may be cost effective, but we don't have the data to show that. Um, Yeah. And we also don't include the heart attacks, the strokes, the loss of, of, of the ability to do daily activities of daily living, the cost of moving into a nursing home, the cost of moving in with your family and one of your family members have to giving up work to take care of you. None of that gets put into the cost-effective analyses. More questions? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, thank you for the really nice lecture. And, and it has something, my question relates to the, exactly that last point you made. Um, you know, sometimes when we, I'm really glad we actually do trials now focused on older adults and focused with, with the comorbidities, but still in a clinical trial, um, even like severe disease and hospitalization endpoints are hard to get. And then you don't get to measure those ancillary factors. And then you go and you present and they're like, well, where's these endpoints? Yes. <laughs> what is your thought yeah. and how do we solve that? Um, what is the population we're enrolling? We're enrolling because I I've done these studies. I mean, they're literally the people who do senior Olympics and read to the blind and help help the old people in their community who are usually 20 years younger than them. Um, They are not the one who's at risk for hospitalization. They're still at risk, but they're not at risk like their neighbor who never entered the door for the trial. So we need some measure of frailty, and we actually need to have a certain percentage of enrolled patients with frailty, and we need to randomize um, based on level of frailty. And then I think we're going to get our hospitalizations and myocardial data that we want. Hi, thanks for a really interesting talk. The point about healthcare workers being immunized to prevent um, infections in nursing homes was really interesting. And I think anyone that's had a family member in a nursing home, obviously you don't want to go and, you know, kill grandma. But do you think then there's opportunities or need to also enforce that for visitors you know if grandchildren yeah. especially are visiting is that like you know COVID testing became a thing often RDTs at the door but can you um, enforce vaccination status and how do you think that would play out? It depends on your political climate and um, we would have a very difficult time doing that right now in the U.S. Um, but recently I've done my tour of nursing homes and assisted living <laughs> for the, the parents and grandparents um, And there are facilities that require proof of vaccination before entry. And what vaccinations would that be? That would be COVID. Okay. I'm hoping to work with them to make that. Blue, RSV. Yeah. Um, I have a follow-up question on healthcare worker vaccination. So the WHO recommends 10 vaccines for healthcare workers or prioritizes 10 anyway recommended but we don't always see those policies implemented or even recommendations where where do you think we can improve and how do you think we can improve the I guess uptake or even checking the status of those 10 some might be vaccinated as kids but there have been schedule changes etc so a yeah. little bit your thoughts on healthcare workers. the majority of vaccines for healthcare workers are, pre- are to prevent the healthcare worker from getting sick we don't want our surgeons getting hepatitis B So that is an issue of protecting the healthcare worker. It's sometimes much more difficult to convince someone to get vaccinated to prevent infection in another person. Um, And so I really think that's two questions. One is how do we protect our healthcare workers? And then how do we convince our healthcare workers they want to protect patients? And that is a realm of study I have no idea because that's the realm of study of how to motivate people and change their mind. Um, And we need more social scientists to come play with us to help us do that. Yeah. Am I am I over time? Oh yeah. Okay, Matt. 
So yeah, so Kip, great talking. And I've I've heard you say at ACIP meetings, we're not studying vaccines in the groups who need those vaccines. And, and I know you spoke to this a little bit, but you know, one of the things I've learned from this course, including the exercise where we talked about phase three clinical trials, is that there's just all these trade-offs. So you, you, you discussed some of those, but could you talk about the trade-offs of um, enrolling a much more frail population of elderly? Sort of what are the reasons that that's not done? Yeah, so when you're doing these studies and going to the FDA or the EMA, you want to awesome results. And who do you get awesome results in? Those really cool older adults that are really healthy and have no comorbid conditions. Once you start enrolling the frail or those with lots of comorbid conditions, your VE does not look as good. And that's the trade-off. And when you have invested billions in a vaccine, you're going to be rather cautious. It takes millions of dollars to do large clinical trials. It is not cheap. Now, I'm going to tell you, every site has to have a bus, and you have to go to patients' homes or skilled facility. And some of them may or may not be able to consent for themselves, so you're going to have to find a family member. So now your cost of your clinical trial has just skyrocketed. Um, totally worth it from my standpoint, not totally worth it to the accountants. Yeah. Would safety be also like an issue in the frail? Yeah. Um, so I'm kind of, I was not a happy camper when we recommended COVID vaccine in nursing homes without doing a study in nursing homes. And the reason being is people die in nursing homes on a regular basis. And no one knows this. When you ask the American Geriatric Society, they have a very hard time getting you the number of people that die in a nursing home. And now we're going to introduce a vaccine that everyone's scared of, and people are going to die. And we're not going to know if it's because of the vaccine or because that's normal. And how do you communicate people normally die? I mean, we know that, theoretically, but when it's your mother, it's much less... Um, no, you know, you don't really grasp that. So I think one of the things is uh, we really need to understand what are the adverse events that happen in older adults on a daily basis. Like how many older adults die, which age groups, which kind of living facility is key. The other thing is I love doing trials in older adults, but you better know half your time is looking for medical records about the adverse events. They have heart attacks. They decide to have surgery. They have cancers at much higher rates. Um, when you are a pharmaceutical company doing these studies, you don't hire one person to look at the adverse events. You hire a team because it is the norm to have adverse, adverse events. And it's not adverse events necessarily the drug because it happens in the same number of placebo participants. So and you really have to be able to weed that out. Yeah. Maybe I'd, I, I had one question, a little bit out of the presentation, just in terms of um, one thing that we're kind of struggling with the, with the routine EPI for children versus this population is more on the existing platform, right, mm -hmm. uh, for delivery. So can you can you expand a little bit on the existing platforms? Yeah, does any country here have a platform for older adults? Yeah, no. Um, it's a huge change. Um, and I think a lot of times we thought, we don't need to worry about the older adults, but as this population grows and as more people work, who's taking care of the children? They play an essential role in many households. They are daycare. They are the housekeepers. They make dinner. Um, so they contribute in ways that we don't measure. Almost like how we didn't measure stay at home, the work of stay at home moms years ago in economic analyses. Um, so we need to develop that platform. And how you're going to do it is going to be very country dependent. But none of us have one. I mean, we also have this habit of you get flu at 65, you get shingles at 60. Like, we, we, kids are so easy. I know they're not. 
I'm not a pediatrician. I know it's not easy, but there's a schedule. Everyone's got a schedule and they work with the schedule and the kids come in the visit for their healthy, healthy visit. And it's tied to their immunization schedule. And we don't have that at all for adults. Yeah. Um, are there any other vaccines that you'd reformulate for elderly adults? No, I just want some new ones. I want groupie strap. Whoever's working on groupie strap, think older adults. Diabetics. <laughs> yeah. Hi, thanks for the talk. really interesting talk. I just wondered, from is there any learnings from the COVID-19 vaccines, considering that most of the trials were done in healthy, young adults, but actually the priority groups were first, you know, the older age groups? I just wondered if there's any learnings that we can apply for the, the larger range of vaccines. Yeah, I do think they actually made an effort to enroll older adults. And they also made an effort. <laughs> I know there's some of you worked really hard to do that. So I'm not trying to downplay that. Um, they also try to do diversity because um, different economic groups and different racial groups may, are, may have immune senescence at a much younger age. They have may have more, more comorbid conditions. And so I think this was the first time we've successfully enrolled more diversity in these studies, um, which I think is incredibly important with the age, and I think we need to start applying to other studies. We have time for one more question. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Hi, I'm Ovika. I, I, I work for um, a pharmaceutical company, so I just also want to point out that sometimes – you know, this enrollment in phase three trials are also in collaboration with the regulators. Mm -hmm. For example, I once did a study in, in you know, pneumococcal vaccines in young adults with comorbid conditions who would be the target for pneumococcal vaccination at a young age. But many of the regulators said, if you want an indication, I mean, if the indication is 18 plus, you need to also enroll healthy adults 18 to 49 years of age. Um, and uh, then, you know, sometimes there is this issue with immunobridging to a population there where, you know, previously efficacy was demonstrated, then you need to enroll 60 to 64 year old because that's where, for example, pneumococcal pneumonia, the original, um, you know, efficacy was demonstrated. So there's always this kind of interaction too, you know, with yeah. the indication, the label and the regulators and what ideas they have in terms of um, you know the the the, um, the the groups that you know are required for getting licensure. Okay. We all have a lot to learn about this topic, including our regulators. Um, and I think they are learning as fast as they can now as these vaccines are coming to them. Um, the last COVID vaccine for the FDA Verpac was what ninety five percent pediatrician. <laughs> Um, which are great. I love my pediatricians. We totally, they trained me, taught me how to do vaccines, taught me everything I need to know about vaccines, but don't know anything about geriatrics. And so I think we need to also change that. We need anyone who does an adult doctor or interested in adults can play with me. We can do all kinds of fun stuff. Um, but I think we need more people educated and we need to educate, um, our, our regulatory agencies. <laughs>